Welcome to Worship at Christ Church Presbyterian. We're grateful you've decided to be here with us, and we hope you'll be encouraged as you participate in today's service. So join with us now as Pastor Robbie Hendrick leads us in worship of the one true and living God. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christ Church. We're so glad that you're here. There's a lot going on. If you guys just keep pulling them through, that'd be great. A lot going on in the life of the church. I want to make you aware of some of those things. Don't forget that tonight we will close out uh, the Lord's Day together and a worship service this evening at 6 o'clock. We've been going through the book of Galatians together. And so we're going to continue in that vein. Also, don't forget to drop off your tithes and offerings in the plate that's in the back. And we have not been passing those for quite some time. So as you come in or even as you leave or... If you choose, you can mail in your check or you can give online. It does not matter. There are plenty of ways to be able to do that. There should be a sheet of paper in your seat somewhere close to you called the Friendship Register. Please take that Friendship Register and fill it out and pass it down the row. Oh, no, don't pass it down the row. I've just said that my whole life. So don't pass it down the road. Just leave it in your seat. We'll pick it up whenever you guys leave. And it helps us with attendance to make sure that we're still connecting with everybody. Uh, one of the, the little boxes on that sheet talk about Wednesday night. We are doing Wednesday night dinners together from 5.15 to 6 o'clock, and then we have a Bible study or something for all ages from 6 to 7. If you are going to come and be with us on Wednesday night, come on out. Just mark on that box that you're coming so that we make sure that we have enough food. It's important to know that uh, everything that we do, we try to be uh, CDC compliant as much as we can. And so Wednesday night is no different. Uh, so come on out and be with us. This Wednesday night, we've been talking about the character traits of God. This Wednesday, we're going to be talking about uh, the, the immutability. Now, if that doesn't bore you to sleep, I don't know what else can other than to say this. Uh, it's one thing to say that God doesn't change. It's another to read in the Bible at least a time or two where it seems as if God does change his mind. And so Wednesday night, we're going to talk about those. And so I hope that kind of sparks you to come and be with us and how we put all of that together. There are Bible studies all throughout. Uh, you can read about them in the bulletin. Make sure you, you get caught up on all of that as well. Uh, last week, you should have received a letter about our capital campaign. If you are a member or regular attender, make sure that you're praying through what the Lord would have you give toward that campaign. We're still looking to build an educational building out here, uh, which is really the, our future as a church uh, Louis Burkhoff once said that uh, what our covenant children become is what our community will be. And it's important for us as we set up for the future what the Lord has for this community. We want to be ready with our covenant children to pass them off to the next generation. Also, don't forget that today we are relaunching Children's Church. Is that what you're going to say to me? <laughs> so, yeah, what she said. Um, now, what was that? Oh, Children's Church. Wednesday, oh, today, you will see in your bulletin that there is a time where our children can leave to go to Children's Church. And so make sure that you keep up with that in your bulletin as well. And also, I think I just heard from the Holy Spirit that sounds a lot like my wife, that uh, she may need a volunteer or two on Wednesday night with the children for October. And there's only three in October because we're doing the fall festival the last Wednesday night. So three Wednesday nights in October. If you'd like to help out on Wednesday night, you can call our interim children's director and she's happy to help. All right. We're here this morning to worship the Lord and that's why we're gathered. So let's take a minute. Let's begin to quiet our hearts down together and begin to focus on him uh, as we seek to do his will in worshiping him this morning.
It is God himself who calls us to worship him. Hear the call to worship from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for today, thankful for the opportunity you give us to gather as your people, even on this, the Sabbath day, to worship you. Lord, we pray that you would continue to guide our hearts. May we focus upon you and you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our Trinity hymnal and turn to 345, our hymn of adoration, glorious things of thee are spoken. 345, let's stand and sing together. Please remain standing as we recite the Apostles' Creed together, which is found in your bulletin. I will ask you, Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father, once again, we come to you so grateful, so thankful that we are able to gather this morning as your people. We do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who not only leads us, but has also paid the price for our sin, and now sits at your right hand, interceding for us. Lord, we are grateful for any sign of repentance that we have, knowing that we are sinners in your sight and in need of a Savior. And we pray that you would give us more signs of repentance. We do pray, Lord, that you would reveal to us our weakness, that we may know that our strength comes only from you. Lord, we know that your word teaches us that our sins are black and deep and they rise from a stony and proud and self-righteous heart. We pray that you would help us even now to confess them with mourning and regret and self-loathing with no pretense to merit or even excuse. And Lord, even now, in the stillness of these next few minutes, we pray that you would draw our hearts to you as we confess silently our personal sin to you. Father, we do thank you for the assurance of pardon that we have from your word that tells us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We do rest in that promise, knowing that you are a God who is truth and a God who does not lie. Lord, we come before you. We pray for healing, that you would come manifest your power and goodness in us. We pray for faith, that you would increase our faith. We are like the man who says, I believe, help me in my unbelief. You have given us faith and we pray that you would maintain it and strengthen it and increase it for our richer joy and your greater good. We pray, Lord, that you would center it upon the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your son. That you would center it upon the majesty of you, our Father. And that you would center it upon the operations of the Holy Spirit, our Comforter. But then and only then can we bring our hearts to you full of love and gratitude and hope and joy. Lord, we need wisdom to follow you, so please be our guide. We need passion to love you more, never wavering in our trust of you. We need compassion for one another. May your love shine through us as we see others in need. We need strength and only can that you can give to conquer the sin that lies within us. And Lord, it is from this foundation only that we bring our petitions to you. And this morning we pray for many things. We pray for the salvation of your people. You have promised that not one who has been given to the Father by the Son will be snatched from his hand, and we thank you for that promise. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will rain down on us and continue to draw us closer to you and closer to each other, not just here, but throughout the world. We do pray for Augusta and its surrounding areas that you would pour out your spirit here. May we be a light on a hill for the sake of the message of the gospel and the furtherment of your kingdom. We do pray for this country. We pray for its leaders our president in particular, all of those in Washington, even those that are in civil service locally, that you would give each and every one a humble reliance upon you, Lord, that you would, if you do not, if they do not know you, Lord, that you would pierce their hearts of their sin and that they would come to know you and that they would continue to lead from their knees as they seek to do your will and rely upon your wisdom and your truth and how they choose to lead. We pray, Lord, that you would refocus their efforts to be servants of the people instead of constantly attacking one another. Father, we do long to be one nation 
under God. May we have a people who lead us that focuses on that nation. Lord, we do pray for our military. We pray that you would keep them safe and fulfill their every need. And we thank you even for our veterans who have gone before us. And the great gift of freedom that you have given us through them. They have provided such a great treasure. May we never take that for granted. We do pray for the world that you would bless every church of every tribe, of every tongue, of every nation that worships you, Yahweh, alone, that gathers every hour upon the hour of this day, the Sabbath day. Lord, we do pray for those who are hurting. We pray that you would comfort them. Those that have been affected by coronavirus in some negative way. Lord, we do pray that you would give us wisdom to not be foolish and the strength to not walk in fear when it comes to how we approach this pandemic. We pray for those that are hurting regarding the discord of this nation. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to pour out your spirit upon this nation. We pray for those who in your name are witnessing around the world. There are many that we support here locally in our local church. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to use them as your instrument and tool to draw people to yourself through the message of your word and that your kingdom would increase. Lord, we do have much to be thankful for, but most of all, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus, the one who leads us and the one who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our hymn of preparation comes out of our Trinity hymn number 37. All that I owe, I owe to thee. Hymn number 37. Let's stand and sing together. Please be seated. Be reminded too that K4 through third grade Children's Church starts today. So if you missed that opportunity to leave at the beginning of the last verse, you may sneak on out right now as the rest of us take our Bibles and turn to John chapter 11. Now look, only K4 through third grade can leave. Everybody else got to stay. John chapter 11, this is our third week of being in John 11. I will say this, uh, today will be our last week in John chapter 11, even though we are just now beginning to scratch the surface of what is in this beautiful, wonderful chapter on the raising of Lazarus. Uh, It is so rich and so deep, and we begin to kind of feed off of that over the last couple of weeks. Uh, Two weeks ago, let me just give you where we've come so far. Two weeks ago, we saw really the people in the passage. We looked at Martha being the worker, uh, constantly serving uh, Christ any time that he was around. We saw Mary being the worshiper. Uh, She was always at Jesus' feet. And then we saw Lazarus being the witness, not only by his resurrection, but also sitting at the table with Jesus. And we read this in chapter 12, verse 2. And then we saw again in 1210, the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And so we know that Lazarus by his life was a witness. We also know that he was sitting at the table with Jesus. And we also know that he prophetically spoke about him. And that's why they were looking to put him to death. We also looked a couple of weeks ago at the Jews who came to console Mary and Martha at the time and yet could not give any hope to them. The best that Judaism could offer was commiseration. The Jews had no clear testimony to eternal life. The limit of their faith was really this life only and not the next. 
And that's when Jesus steps in. And we saw this a couple of weeks ago. It was beautiful. It gives uh, what the Jews uh, could not even offer, and that is eternal life. By his affection, the Bible says he loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And by his proclamation, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And also by his power, for he raised Lazarus from the dead. And we even talked about how awkward it would have been had he said, Lazarus, come out. And everybody just kept standing there. We know that what happened to Lazarus physically is what happens to us spiritually. That we are dead in our sin and Jesus effectually calls us to himself and raises us from the dead. And when we put our faith and trust in him to forgive our sins, we gain then eternal life and will live with him forever. And the beauty of the passage is that Jesus looks at him and says, unbind him and let him go. I.e., he has now been set free from sin free from spiritual death, free from Satan, to do what he really was created to do, and that is to worship God. Now, all of that was two weeks ago. Uh, last week, and I'll, this is a little shorter, uh, we looked at the same story, uh, narrative, through the eyes of Jesus and saw that Jesus loved Lazarus. He also knew Lazarus. How else would he know that he had died uh, unless he knew intimately who Lazarus was and was sovereign over all circumstances? We also saw that Jesus has a plan. He called Lazarus out and he raised Lazarus from the dead and then he freed him from sin, death, and Satan. Uh, well, again, let me just say we've only scratched the surface of this text, but we're going to dig in one more time. Uh, today, we're going to see the proper or what I call the biblical approach to prayer. Now, that should raise at least a little bit of a question for you because there's really not a whole lot of prayer in the passage. But when we read through the passage, be looking for uh, this you know, prayer and how it looks as we read through it. We're going to read it again, John chapter 11. This time I'm going to read a little bit faster than I have in the past couple of weeks because we've been studying it now for three or four weeks. And so here we go. John 11, the inerrant and infallible word of God. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the son of man may be glorified. I'm sorry, the son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. 
Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Let's pray. Father, once again, we come to you so grateful for your word, the inerrancy and infallibility of it. Lord, we pray even today that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to comprehend what you have for us today. God, we pray that you would change our hearts to be more like you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> my, my wife is the, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> my wife is the prayer warrior of our family. She doesn't like it when I say that. But there have been many a times where I would be walking through the living room or on our back porch and she would be sitting there almost as if she's staring out into space. And I would say, honey, are you okay? And she would say, yes. And I would say, what's the matter? And she says, nothing, I'm praying. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's great. I'm praying. It certainly doesn't look like you're praying. And I've come to realize after a season of time that a lifestyle of prayer is hardly noticeable. And yet when we look at a text like this, what we're seeing is a lifestyle of prayer by these sisters that is hardly noticeable in the text. But the more we dig into it, the more we're able to see it. So we not only see the prayer, but we see the proper perspective on prayer and how we are not only to approach prayer, but how we are to receive the answer from God that he gives us. So let's jump in. Roman numeral number one, why do we pray at all? We pray for a lot of reasons. Uh, we think through this in our minds. Here are some of them. Simply to praise God for who he is. Sometimes our prayers are nothing more than praise. Sometimes we pray to repent of our sin, which we've done even this morning. Sometimes we pray to seek wisdom and guidance from God and things that are happening in our lives. But with every prayer, and there are many other reasons than that, but we usually add in that prayer, and most of the time it's the main reason we pray, is we are to bring some request to God. There's something going on in our life. We're asking the question, God, I need your help. Would you help me? Now, the question that we have is, why do we have any requests at all? And the answer is because we live in a fallen world. And we see and experience the effects of sin all the time in our life. Now, sometimes the effects of sin is personal sin that has created something in us that now the consequence of it is playing itself out in, in our life. Sometimes it's other people's sin that has effect, affected us in some way. Sometimes it's just corporate sin, the sin of a nation. And we read this in, throughout the Old Testament and in different people groups. Why do we have any requests at all? Because we live in a fallen world. You see, just because we are saved from sin does not mean that we are saved from the effects of sin. We see it every day in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in our nation, and even in our world. We need help from the effects of sin. And so we, we pray, we go to God, and we, we make requests of God. 
In fact, he actually tells us to bring our request to him. Philippians 4, 6 says, let your request be made known to God. And this is actually what we're seeing in this passage by these two sisters. The two sisters are doing what we would do if we were walking in the same situation. Our brother is sick. What should we do? Let's go tell Jesus. Verse 3, the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Their brother was sick and they told the Lord about it. That's prayer. They brought their petition to God. Now the question is, on what basis did they bring that prayer? Which is really Roman numeral number two. What was the approach? What gives them the courage and the audacity to bring this request to Jesus? If we think about our own prayers, our prayers can be based upon a lot of things. Sometimes it's our simple wants in life. Lord, please let me make an A on this test. Don't say you've never prayed that before. Sometimes that's our desires. Ooh, look at that car. I wish I had one of those, Lord. Sometimes we come out of our afflictions. Lord, I'm struggling. Would you comfort me as I walk through fill in the blank? Sometimes we come simply out of our love for Jesus. Sometimes we approach the throne of grace because we know at least that God hears us. That he has the power to do something. He is sovereign over all things and controlling the circumstances of our lives and that he's good. See, sometimes we simply come to him with our request because we know that he's good. Most of the time when we go to the Lord with some prayer request, it is a combination of a lot of those things. But for Mary and Martha, the text tells us exactly why they came to Jesus. Because Jesus loved Lazarus. That was it. Lord, we know that you love him. We love him too. So we ask. While Jesus' sovereignty and goodness and power were certainly a part of the reason they took their request to Jesus, because why would you take a request to somebody if you know that they can't do a thing about it? So we know that sovereignty, goodness, and power were certainly a part of that. They would be speaking in vain if they did not believe that Jesus had the power to change something. Their approach was not about his sovereignty, his goodness, or even his power. It was based upon his love. His love for Lazarus. Lord, the one you love is sick. In fact, it is the love of Christ for his people that allows us peace and comfort when our prayers or the answer to our prayers are delayed. Or dare I say, when God may say, no. Because the hard part of prayer for us is not bringing our petitions to God. The hard part for us is accepting the answer from God. And how do these women in this passage accept what God brought to them can teach us a lot about how we accept answers to prayer. We learn by studying the scriptures that God does not always act in the way that we think he should act, nor does he act when we think he should act. In this narrative, the Bible tells us he stayed two extra days. That kind of shocks us a little bit. The one you love is sick, and yet he stayed two extra days. Our expectation would be for him to go straight and to help. Or he doesn't even have to go. He could help without going. We've seen this already in John where he healed a man's son and never even went to see him. But he didn't do any of those things and Lazarus died. One theologian says it this way, Jesus 
may be completely informed of our troubles and yet act as though he were indifferent to it. And it raises questions in our spirit and in our heart as to why God is doing what he's doing. You see, in this passage, we learn that prayer for the sick may not be answered, particularly in the way that we expect. And the comfort that we have is not that Jesus will always answer our prayers in what we think is the affirmative. The comfort that we have is that Jesus, who made us and is sovereign over all things, will do what is best based upon his holiness and his love for his people. So there is this good, holy purpose, even for the delay and answer to prayer. And what we see here is why God delays, or maybe even says no to our prayers. Now, first, let me tell you all of the reasons that we think of in our mind this wrong. Why is it that God is not answering my prayer? Why is it that God is not moving? How, why do I not sense his presence? What is going on? This horrible thing is happening in my life, in my family member's life, in the world today, in the city I live in. Whatever it is, why is God not answering the prayer? Let me say this. It's not indifference. It's not because Jesus doesn't care. Because in the passage it says he loved Lazarus. It's not preoccupation. It's not that Jesus was too busy or God is too busy to look and to answer your prayer. And it's not a lack of power. So many times we run to, well, maybe God just doesn't have the power to do this. He doesn't have what it takes to be able to do what I need him to do. Maybe he delayed because he could not help Lazarus. He could not raise Lazarus from the dead. He was already gone. And we know that's not true. I wrestle with all three of these all the time in my prayer life when I'm waiting on God to answer something. I'm like, God, I know that you care. I know that you're not preoccupied with something else. And I know that you have the power to do these things. John 1, 3 says, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. John has already set us up to say he had the power to raise Lazarus from the dead. So it's not that he doesn't care. It is not that he's preoccupied. It's not because of a lack of power. Jesus stayed two extra days and Lazarus died because he loved him. You see, sickness and death are not incompatible with the love of God. The text says Jesus loved Lazarus, but Jesus also waited for two days. These are not incompatible things. This tells us that there must be some connection between his delay and his love. His delay is purposeful for a lot of reasons. Let me just give you two quickly that meld into one. To mold our wills to his will... And to strengthen our faith. See, sometimes God delays an answer. Sometimes Jesus may say no to a request that we have. Why? Because he is trying to mold our will to his will. Why? Because he is trying to strengthen our faith as we continue to walk this planet. Our faith grows when we are forced to wait, trusting that God knows what he is doing and that he is fulfilling his purposes in our lives. How can we say that God is withholding something from us? How can we say that that's a loving act? Well, if God is our father, let's look at how fathers today act. At least the ones that are modeling Christ, what do we say? Good fathers do withhold things from their children. Why? So that they will mature and they will grow. And their faith will be strengthened as they struggle to do the things that God has called them to do. Now, I'm not saying that's true every time. We understand that parents step in and they must do some things. And I, under, I get that. But in, in all that I've done in my lifetime, we always talk about the helicopter parent that's always hovering over the child all the time. La, 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 la. And then the snowplow parent that kind of clears the road so that there's no bumps or bruises on the road. And they walk this... That's not effective parenting skills. They never struggle in life and they will never mature if that's the road that you take. They must be able to climb the mountains themselves. 
We withhold things from our children for what purpose? It's not because we don't love them. And it's not because we don't want what's best for them. In fact, it's just the opposite of that. As parents, we withhold things from our children to strengthen them and to teach them and to mold them into what Christ has for them. The same is true with our Heavenly Father. In fact, that's where we get the example from. Because how much more does our Heavenly Father love us than we love our own children? And yet He chooses to delay or withhold things from us to strengthen us and to push us in our faith and to mature us in how we're walking. God delays because he loves. And the Bible teaches us that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And we cannot see the end from the beginning as he can. And still we can see the plan of God begin to unfold here in the passage as to why he delayed. Why did God choose? If you're going to withhold because it's good for me, would you please tell me why it's good for me? Verse 4 tells us. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So now here's the next question. How is the glory of God manifested in the death and resurrection of Lazarus? Three quick things. Number one, we see the glory of God being demonstrated by the power of God. He obviously shows his power by resurrecting Lazarus when he looks at him and says, Lazarus, come out. But we also know that what happens to Lazarus physically is what happens to all believers spiritually. The Bible tells us that we were dead in our sin. And Ephesians 2 continues to say, and God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I was flirting with doing Ephesians on Sunday night. And I have a feeling I'm going to do that after we get done with Galatians. I'm just saying. The resurrection of Lazarus was for the glory of God in that it demonstrated the power of God to conquer death, hell, and Satan. And that glory of God was demonstrated and it was an encouragement to the believers that were standing around. Obviously, Lazarus was encouraged. But then there were the sisters, Martha and Mary. Their, their faith is actually matured. We, we watch these women grow in their faith right before our very eyes. Remember when Martha was upset over one person coming to a dinner party at her house and it was Jesus and she's running around like a chicken and she, does, she can't get Mary to help. And she's like, Jesus, would you tell Mary to help? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, stop. And then when we get to chapter 12, there's at least, 17, at least 17 people at this party, and Martha is not upset at all. She's serving, doing what she's called to do, helping out where she can help, completely calm. What are we, we're watching her mature in her faith right before our very eyes, doing what God has called her to do. Mary was the same way. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus when Martha said, will you please tell Mary to help? Jesus says, no. Then Mary goes out, and Mary and Martha are together, and, and Martha runs out to meet Jesus, but Mary sits at the house. Why did she stay? She was still grieving over her brother. She was an introvert. She didn't know how to get up and run out to meet Jesus. And then Martha shows up and says, the teacher wants to see you, and that's when she goes. We're watching her mature right before our very eyes spiritually. We're watching their faith grow because the answer to the prayer was delayed. The same is true for the disciples. Verse 15 tells us, for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. And it wasn't just about belief, but their faith was actually strengthened by what they saw. Imagine when Lazarus comes out and they're standing there. Then there were the other people standing around, like family and friends. In verse 45, it says, many believed in him. And let, again, let me say for all believers, it is a great encouragement to know that what happens to Lazarus physically will happen to all believers spiritually, conquering death, hell, and Satan through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God's power is shown and believers are encouraged. But there's a third reason for the delay, and that is so that unbelievers are warned. 
There are still, even after all of this, there are still some who do not believe. And the resurrection of Lazarus is really a warning shot across the bow. Verse 46 says, some of them went to the Pharisees. In other words, some of them still did not believe who Jesus was. The resurrection of Lazarus is a warning for them. It is irrefutable evidence of Christ's power demonstrated through his love, and yet they did not accept it. And even here, even the warning is God showing his mercy and grace and love, for he has been very patient in demonstrating his love and power to them. All right, a couple of takeaways, and I'm done. How do we take a passage like this and wrap it all together? <clears throat> Number one, when we approach Jesus with our prayers, the basis of that needs to be out of his love for us. Though he is high <clears throat> and mighty, he is not lofty and distant. He is full of compassion he sympathizes deeply with his suffering people. He himself is acquainted with grief. And he invites us to pour out our grief before him. But know that his love for us, his love for us will drive his answer to us. And if he can love us more by delaying the answer or saying no to the prayer, then he's going to either delay it or say no. But at the end of the day, it is his love that drives it. The question is, when he delays or if he says no, do we still trust that he loves us? Do we still trust that he's going to do what's best for us and for his glory? Even when he doesn't act the way we hope he would and says no to something that we treasure. We approach him out of his love for us. Number two, there's a reason that we use John eleven twenty five. 25. This really doesn't have anything to do with the, the text, but we're going to jump in it anyway. There is a reason we use John eleven twenty five 25 at funerals. It says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Why is this verse so important? Because when we bury a believer, uh, we are, number one, professing God's power to resurrect the dead. In fact, when we bury a believer, we're saying that that believer is already, uh, his spirit has already been resurrected. And so when we bury the believer, we are professing God's power to resurrect the dead. Number two, as believers, we are encouraged that this is not the end because what happened to Lazarus physically happens to us spiritually. And so when we die, we too are resurrected as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the most complete sense, our prayers at that moment, when my faith becomes sight, though they have been delayed, have now been answered. And the promises have been fulfilled. And if we're talking about a loved one, we would say that our friend or our loved one is now experiencing all the things that we've been praying for. Peace and comfort and complete health because he has been made perfect in holiness. And what that person has gone through the moment their faith became sight, we too as believers will go through, and that is an answer to all of our prayers, even if it is delayed for a season. So we are professing God's power. We are encouraged to see that this is not the end. And when we bury believers, we are also giving a warning for those who do not know Christ, who may be there for the day. That God is still showing great patience to them until the end of this life. So all of that's number two. Number three, and I'm done. Hang in there with me. Though there are a lot of things that God may delay on and some things he may say no to, there are a few prayers that he will say yes to and he will say yes immediately every single time. And we cannot end a sermon like this without talking about that issue as well. There may be times that God delays his answer to prayer, demonstrating his love and his glory. But there are also times that he answers immediately 
every time. Delays come in our life for things like this. Uh, maybe when we're praying for guidance, Lord, I really need some wisdom and direction here. Can you help me? Sometimes he will delay that because he wants you to walk down a path until he gets you where he wants you to be, and then he will direct you in the right way. Sometimes healing is delayed. Lord, would you please heal uh, my broken arm, and it takes eight weeks or whatever, you know, so there's this idea that healing may be delayed, or the answer may be no, depending on what we're praying for. Changing of circumstances may be delayed, or said, you know, Lord, this is a horrible circumstance I'm in. I wish that you would change it. I wish you would move it. I wish you would pull me out of it and go here. Sometimes the answer is delayed. Sometimes the answer may be no. I want you to live in that circumstance for a reason to mature your faith and do the things that I've asked you to do. So I get all of that. However, there are times when God answers immediately, and it happens every single time. And here are those times when we pray for spiritual growth. Do you realize that when you pray for spiritual growth, God is going to answer that prayer? Now, you want to go from, you know, two to eight on a scale of one to 10. He may take you to two to 2.5. But he does answer that prayer and he answers it immediately. When we confess our sins, God does not delay in forgiveness. And he certainly says, does not say no to it. When we ask God to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, God is sitting on ready to do that immediately for us. And when we cry out for salvation, God does not say, well, maybe later. Or, I don't know, I'm kind of indifferent about it. No. He is immediate in his answer. And there is no delay God does not delay on those things. Isaiah 65, 24 tells us, before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear them. Let me give you one example of this. And it's, we've studied it already in John, but I'm going to pull it out of Matthew 14. When Jesus is walking on the water and Peter says, hey, can I come join you? Robbie Hendrick paraphrase. Hey, can I come join you? And Jesus says, come on. And so Jesus uh, Peter gets out of the boat and begins to walk. And of course, he's looking at Jesus and everything's fine. But then he looks down at the water and he begins to sink, right? We know the story very well. And you know what he does? He cries out to Jesus for help. What did Jesus do? Did he say, you know what? I'm kind of indifferent about this. I don't know. Or, you know, I may answer that, but let me think about it for a little while. Or, no, I'm not. If you can get here on your own, good luck. No. Matthew 14, 31 says, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and he took hold of him saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Immediate help in strengthening faith. That's what we see. Our approach to prayer is modeled here. We are called to bring our petitions to God. We see the effects of sin in our lives. We must approach God on the basis of his love for his people. And we must also accept his purpose, which is his love for us. And however he chooses to answer those prayers, knowing that there's a plan to glorify himself by demonstrating his power, even unto death, and encouraging his people and warning the non-believer. Now, let me just say this, and I'm done. There have been many people who have gone through some pretty tragic scenarios in their life. And it seems like the more tragedy you walk through, the harder this is to grab. Or the more tragedy you walk through, the easier this is to accept. We've walked through some pretty tough things in our life in my 30 years of ministry. I've buried children. I buried four children at one time. We've done some pretty incredible things. And every time I have to come back here to say that this happened because God loved me. God loved them. And he perfected them in that moment for his glory. Because if we don't land here, then tragedies are meaningless and hopeless for us. We never get over them. 
even though we will never forget them. This, this doctrine of Jesus responding to our prayer life because of his love for us is the thing that gives us hope to face the next moment in our life. Knowing that even in a delay, there's going to come a great answer at the end where we are made perfect in holiness and we are able to live with him forever because what happened to Lazarus physically happens to all believers spiritually. We will be raised and we will be able to be seated with him in the heavenly places. Thanks be to God for his love for us. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that you love us and approach you first with that in mind as we come before you even today. Lord, we do know that you're sovereign. We would go nowhere else with any request that we have for there is nowhere else to go. But Lord, we do pray for so many things and we pray, Lord, that you would continue to answer those prayers based upon your love for us, knowing that even in a delay or in a no, that you are still a sovereign, good God who loves his people. We are grateful for that, and we rest in that, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. The preaching of the word calls for a response from the people. We will find that in our Trinity hymnal number 465. Let's take our hymnal in turn. 465, marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Let's sing it loud. 465. And now receive the benediction. And now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said, amen.
Thanks for joining us for Worship at Christ Church Presbyterian. We're grateful that you were able to take part in worship with us, and we hope that the time you've spent here has been an encouragement to you. Please remember to stay in touch, and if there's something you need or something you'd like for us to lift up in prayer, call us at 706-210-9090. Of course, please continue to pray for each other and for those who lead us that they would seek God in their decisions. And don't forget to come back again to our website, myccp.faith, or the Christchurch Facebook page to be a part of worship at Christchurch Presbyterian.